Corbin. Hey, hey. Dude, I Ava set up a webinar channel, but I went into the community <laughs> community one. <laughs> I didn't notice that the other one. But it's, uh, whoops. it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. I hope my yeah, uh, my mic doesn't explode again like the last. <laughs> I mean, your catapult. Yeah, my catapult. <laughs> Ooh, how's everybody doing? You guys good? Living the dream. Well, sweet. I guess before we officially start, let's do... Do we have a few announcements? I think we have a few. Like, I think there's, Yeah, I think there's quite a few. We're going to be at FMX. That's happening very soon. Uh, Corbin and I, we're going to have a talk. I'm going to talk about, hopefully about my explosions emitter that Corbin is currently improving. <laughs> and then Corbin, you're going to talk about your disinte disintegration setups, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, the FMX talk will be very similar to what we're going through now. So yeah. that particular side of it, if you're in this, won't, won't necessarily be unique, but, um, but we're going to be there and you guys, if anybody from here is going to be there, you can say hi to us. We're also going to have a booth. So we're, we're going to be there for five days. Uh, we're going to have our booth. Uh, we're going to be giving, I think FMX special discounts at FMX. So if you are at FMX, find us to get that special FMX discount. Mm. Uh, film effects is currently on the wait list. So if you go to uh, Double Jump Academy uh, website, you can sign up for the waitlist and everybody with everybody who's going to be on the waitlist will get a 15% off when we open the doors. So if you're not on the waitlist, no discount for you. Only the people who are on the waitlist are going to be, uh, we're going to email the discount to them. And I think we're going to open film effects for the first time officially next week, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. I think there's going to be a, a week and a half period where we have the wait list. That's why I'm saying sign up now to get the discount. If you guys haven't already, uh, sign up, uh, in the presale, but yeah, that's the, now's the time. Yeah. What else? Do we have any? Oh yeah, we're going to do. So yeah, we have a bunch of new workshops in development. Mm. Uh, the Unreal Engine Automotive workshop, I thought was very awesome, especially the promos and everything like the level, the quality is super high. So the presale is ending for that, uh, today, or maybe it's tomorrow, depending on your time zone. And then Houdini for games, that's going to be a new workshop. Uh, the promo is more or less finished. I just need to tweak it a bit and then we're going to announce it. Um, and also, uh, Jordan's workshop, uh, unlocking the magic of Houdini, which is going to be more an introductionary, uh, workshop to Houdini, but that doesn't mean it's going to be simple or easy. Just, it's just, a, uh, I feel like it's going to be the most exciting intro to Houdini workshop, just because the way Jordan is teaching and just because of the examples that he's going to be using, they're going to be very practical examples, very cool looking examples. Uh, so that's going to be announced very soon as well. Yeah. I think that's loads, a... <laughs> loads coming. Yeah. I think if it all works out, mm. all of that will be available in some way during the FMX, the FMX week kind of yeah. like you know so it's like whether it's whether it's some of them might be waitlist or pre-sale some of it but like uh, quite a lot of it will actually be for sale yeah whether it's pre-sale or like actually open like film effects will be open um yeah so like 
yeah it's it's all kind of coming together to that at that one one event or obviously even if you're not there but during that time every i think everything will basically be available yep which is exciting yeah yeah it's gonna be awesome and we have a, a lot of, of other workshops in the pipeline as well but yeah. we're kind of releasing them as we i think we're at capacity <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we keep finding new ones that people want to do and then we find really cool people in the industry and they've got yeah. something like like a really cool idea and we're like okay yes make the workshop but also when the hell are we going to actually squeeze it in because it's just too many like so yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's hard like even like i don't think people talk about this but like behind the scenes like everything that's happening you know how much work we have to do to even publish a workshop is insane i feel like yeah. We should do like a webinar on that someday because and show people how it's done but you know like for film yeah. effects i had to upload all of the videos and then encode them and add the watermarks and add the special uh invisible watermarks and ip and everything you know it's it takes a lot of time to just upload all of that let alone editing the trailer and all the promos and then we do different promos but then we have to write the script. You have to record the script. You have to, it's just freaking, it's a full on production. Honestly. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's why I had to jump on full time. That's why all of us, yeah. like we've got three, three of us full time and it's, yeah. it's still intense. It is intense. Which is why also, I guess we should say, cause you know, my original plan was that around about this time I'd be releasing the full film effects as in all three effects would be done. Yeah. But it just, I think it's one of those things where, you know, I really wanted this first one to be really good for you guys. So we put a lot of content in it, not realizing that, man, it really is three workshops. It's like mm. each effect is, is a, a workshop. full workshop. Like we are not doing any overviews. We put down every single node. We write every line of code. Like I think the only node where I skip ahead, where I didn't put it down, like in the video, I say, I just tell you to do it is just like, like a file cache node to mm. just like, oh, it's like between videos, I cached what we did in the previous video. That's about it. Everything else, we do it all. Um, I think the only things I don't go into actually teaching how it's built, but you can open it up and see is the pipeline tools. But that's because I'm going to be separately releasing videos on each of those that's dedicated to those. Um, so everything will be covered, which is why as well, I mean, it turned into like, what was it like 21 hours or something of, of um, footage. And we're still actually even missing the end because we, you know, I'm not an expert in lighting and rendering. Like I, I will fully put my hands up and admit that like, I'm not that good at getting the final image to look good. For me, it's technical, the, the sim side, that's where my skills mm. are. So we've got someone helping us actually light the scene properly. And when it's done properly, I'm going to then have a meeting with them. We're going to discuss the scene, how it's laid out so that I basically learn from him. And then I'm going to show you guys how it's all set out. So, you know, we even want that side, you know, we want it to look beautiful and we want to do the USD side properly. And this mm. guy is a pro pro with USD, yeah. which is why we've got him involved. Right. So, um, even that side, I didn't want to kind of half-ass it and like just do my version of, oh, I'll stick in a couple of lights and cameras. It's like, we're getting it done professionally and then I'm going to show you guys every single node in that layout, like in the sort of the USD side and how to get it to render really well. Um, so, yeah. I wish it had, I'd been able to get it out sooner, but it's for a very, very good reason. It's like, it's literally three workshops that you guys are getting for the price of one. Yeah, it's like you know, film effects, it became an umbrella for three yeah. workshops. In the beginning, we were thinking, oh, film effects and three modules, right? And yeah. each module is going to be like five hours. But now it's like, oh, film effects is, that's almost like the brand. That's the umbrella. Yeah. And yeah. You have one workshop, second and third. Yes. Yeah. Wait, how, how yeah, long fact, did you I say think the first one is? How long is it's it? It's like 20 hours. So, so the disintegration is 20 hours just the disintegration is 20 hours and that's missing a module at the end which is the final usd stuff which i wow. will add as well so it, we're going to basically be close on 23 hours or something like that of like actual content uh, for for the one yeah there's still the other two the other two. which and are going to be just as big if not bigger <laughs> the bonus and then there's the bonus one so yeah yeah you know, i think that this is going to be guys will it's like the the biggest workshop, like the biggest Houdini CG workshop ever. And 
properly. Yeah, I think if you take it and if you finish it by the end, you will be a freaking master of Houdini. Yeah, like that's... I mean, when I'm teaching, I always, you know, it's the type of things that I used to tell my team when I'm, you know, like when I'm you know, at a, as, a, as a supervisor at a studio, I, this is how I'm coaching my team is telling them how to do these things. So, you know, during this whole workshop and following along, you guys will absolutely um, learn something to even no matter what level you are, you'll either pick up a whole lot of stuff um, or you know, at, at the very least, if you're senior, I'm sure you'll still pick up things because yeah uh, it's it's jam packed with stuff and i don't skip anything like i don't believe in really doing overviews or whatever like this is i'm I'm being thorough yeah so yeah so awesome we all we're working as hard as we can to get it done as quick as we can obviously now with um fmx and stuff it kind of throws a little bit of a, a spanner in the works that there's this big event that we've got to prepare for and then we're away for a week but I'm already halfway through the second effect anyway. So as soon as we get back from FMX, I'm going to finish that and hopefully start uh, record that. Um, as much as the recording is like 20 hours or something, I, I smashed through it in like, you know, about four or five days. It's like Dude, uh, just yeah. a marathon for my voice. Yeah. Um, and insane. then we'll do move on to the third effect. Um, so you guys are going to get loads and loads and loads of content out of this. Um, That's awesome. should say as well, and this is all, I mean, what I'm about to say it's not officially decided. I have discussed it with Urban, but we are still t sort of figuring out some of the basics as well of it, or like the logistics. But I am intending to release a VEX fundamentals. But it's not going to be a workshop in the sense that it's all comes out in one go um, and that it's paid or anything. It's um, it's going to be free. It's going to be on the YouTube thing. I know a lot of people ask me about my workshop that i did with rebelway which mm -hmm. apparently is no longer available yeah so don't be tricked by the the <laughs> banner is still my workshop but if you buy it it's actually the new vex workshop apparently which is maybe just a mistake on their side mm -hmm. that's no longer available but i still obviously can't give you those original files because you know that's kind of like it's just not not cool you know but the thing is i know that information and in fact ah, that's years and years old so i would rather teach you as a like probably what six years more experienced artist mm. i would rather teach you now so for anyone who's finding any of the film effects maybe a level above where you kind of are i do explain every expression th and things but in a way that i'm assuming you already know vex but you just are like we're talking about advanced concepts if you don't know vex at all you're probably going to struggle to keep up with the film effects workshop but don't stress because very soon i'm going to start releasing um, and I'll probably do, I don't, know, I don't want to overcommit myself, but I might, it's, it's going to be the short little videos, but like really fundamental concepts all the way up to, I'm just going to literally keep making them every week. Mm. So like maybe like, it's like three videos a week or something. It's just constantly drip feeding and yeah. they'll cover all the fundamentals until we even start to run out of them. Like we've covered every topic, mm. every expression, just everything. And then we will move on to like more advanced practical concepts as well as I'm going to do a similar thing with python particularly with python what i want to do is we're building loads of tools and this is something for you guys to be really excited about is some of them are like the more kind of boring administrative tools things like the scene um, controls node that i've got in the film effects where it's just helping you set up your scene and save it in the right place but others are going to be linked things like the, the emitter tool like the explosion emitter we're doing a lot of work on that um, I've got some crazy like um, advection tools and things that we used on on Avatar, and there's just loads of cool stuff that I'm like developing. Everything we build, I'm going to show you guys. I'm going to do a video showing how to build it, um, both the kind of engine level of like you know, so like the Vex stuff and how it actually works if it's a node like that, as well as the high level python hda all of that i will literally have a video that covers the entire thing so you could build it from scratch if you want um, as well as just a mini video to show how it works like a help file basically and you could then download the whole pipeline so we're basically trying to build a pipeline that anyone like especially freelancers could basically just download and plug in and it's like their own because you, know, you go to a studio and they often have like cool tools then you leave and now you don't have those tools so we're trying to like build our own pipeline that you guys can essentially just feed into right 
all of this that's that's all coming and, and as far as i know the like definitely the vex will do free the python stuff i'm not entirely sure maybe i'll do it for free or maybe it'll be packaged in a workshop i'm not entirely sure um yeah sweet cool well um cool. i don't know if you saw my mug <laughs> where's mine <laughs> i got mine today <laughs> like ava, oh, where's mine ava randomly bought me a mug but it's so awesome and we were really honestly awesome. We've been thinking about um, actually opening up a proper like merch shop. Um, it's just, yeah, a lot. It's, it's again, when I was talking about like all the stuff that goes behind the scenes, like Ava is building the website and she's doing all the designs. So every time we add a feature, you know, like I was talking about maybe creating that crowdfunding module uh, called uh, um, Jumpstart. And we are, everybody was like, yeah, do it, do it. And I'm like, yes, but it takes time. It takes, we need to develop it. So we're doing a lot of things. Uh, it's just, it takes time to make it look uh, proper and good. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, dude, uh, I think you have a demo for us today. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about something that we cover in film effects. Uh, but uh, you're going to, it'll be in a little bit of a different way. So let me... Um share screen all right so obviously i think for those who are heavily involved who are already you know bought film effects we're chatting in the discord then this won't be news to you guys but maybe for those who haven't sort of who aren't in film effects but are thinking of buying it this this will then she just tell you what we're what we're sort of covering. So when we're talking about it being like a full workshop per effect, and it's like twenty hours. I mean, this is essentially every every node here is a video, um, at at Wait. least. In fact, some of them. I'm not seeing your screen. I'm not sure if you not? other people have the same issue. Anyone see? Do you guys see the screen? Okay. No, no, no. Some yes, some no. Okay. Well, okay. I have to see it because I'm recording. <laughs> 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 just maybe restart it yeah just use your imagination guys come on <laughs> right can you see it now no so annoying this is annoying at what what do i do maybe go out jump back in all right i don't know what it could be but turning it off and on again <laughs> usually works <laughs> uh, technology everybody's worried about ai we can't even freaking share our screens <laughs> maybe one day we'll have ai that can help us well, I, dude, I just said that. I was like, everybody's no. worried about AI. Yeah, exactly. We That's what even, I'm saying. Yeah, we just can't even share the freaking screen. Can you see my screen now? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's on the, I, I mean, like literally, I can see my own share of that screen. So how can you not? Try to click on the thing. I'm clicking on it. Anyone? Let's see. I wonder if it's on my side yeah, as well, but I mean, if so some... many other people can't see it. Freaking. Yeah, it's stuck for me as well. Damn. How is it? Freaking... I'm trying to share. I'm sharing an entire screen so what i'm going to try to do is share just that <clears throat> just the window Let's see for now you see any figma no <laughs> oh man <clears throat> And 
I mean, <laughs> come on, Discord. What do we do? <laughs> what do we do? You know. <laughs> How do you fix this? <laughs> oh my god. You, you're just going to have to describe it super clearly now. Just, mm. just act with your hands. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know what to... I mean, some people can see it and some cannot. So what is up with that? Right, let me just the try to... <laughs> maybe, maybe it works. Yeah, exactly. Can maybe... see it now? No. It's... Oh. Like I'm getting a exclamation mark. <laughs> yep. Some yes, some no. Mostly no. No. God damn it. <laughs> and I can uh, <laughs> I can shut down and reboot and rejoin, but I don't know how that. Maybe we start. <laughs> like restart Discord entirely, like literally quit Discord yeah. and then reboot it. Okay. We have, we ha I have Nitro and we boosted this freaking server up uh, a few times. Screen sharing for sure. Use our latest technology to capture a screen. So open this, click on the settings. I don't know. Hey, yo. yo. Yes, no. No. Sam, Sam was saying that open Discord, locate the video, the voice and video tab. There's apparently there's a thing called latest technology to capture a screen. If you scroll up, there's some video tab. Where the heck is that? I don't know. Like this thing. Okay, settings. Voice and video. I mean, it's just a bunch of seti settings for like camera and stuff, but I mean. <laughs> but is there one called? Use latest technology. <laughs> Is that even a thing? I don't see it. I mean, we can try it and we, we can try and go into the other one, like in the webinar chat. Yeah. Okay. So Fletch is saying that that is known to cause issues. Where is it? Very bottom. Do I have to do it as well, or is it just Corbin? Because he's. I mean, it's so annoying because we've done this before. I mean, <laughs> literally. Okay, dude. So go. Yeah, it's it's settings, voice and chat, voice and video. Uh huh. And then scroll down to the bottom. Yeah. And there's yeah. a screen share. Use our advanced technology. <laughs> Sorry, that's technology to capture your screen that doesn't work. No, I don't see screen share at all. Nothing like that. No, dude, you there's, must be. 
It's here. This. I'm in the wrong freaking place. Go on, there's it's settings. Right. It's that little. Right. That's it. Um, literally, it looks different on my side. <laughs> I have a different version. That's what it looks like for me. That same tab. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, off brand uh, Discord. What the hell, man? How can I have a different version? It's not an app, it's a freaking. On the browser, like just reinstall. Well, dude, I don't know. We can uh, let's let's all go into the webinar tab. Maybe that it's gonna work there. I'm gonna re. Well, I'm gonna reboot. Let me go in there. Well. Yeah, you can you can try go in that one and see if it works. <laughs> the other one. Although I don't know, you'll have to also go so that you can see whether you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because I, I, I can see mine over here. All right. Where the heck is the webinar? Oh, yeah. I can I can maybe uh, share my screen just to see if it works. Mm. Yeah, you just, share yours. Okay. So you stop sharing. I mean, <clears throat> even if this works, it's not going to help us in any way, shape, or form. It works for me. I see it. it works. I mean, I can see it. Yeah. So it's definitely on Corbin's side, right? <laughs> Drinking Corbin. What are you doing? <laughs> Look at this beautiful effect. So this is the workshop, guys. Uh, we're going to be blending between the particles. So here you go. Beautiful. Some beautiful stuff. There you go. That's the explosion. The ultimate explosions workshop. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All its glory. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. But, dude, yeah, I don't know. It's probably on your side. But I mean, how can I have a different version of the freaking? Mo like, it's on. Are you on the browser? No. But maybe, you should, maybe try the browser version. I am. You're you're on the browser. Download, yeah. Yes. Oh, dude, that's why it doesn't work. Go on the freaking app. <laughs> I mean, it worked every freaking other <laughs> time that you've ever app. done this, except <laughs> now. So solved. Well, it's not solved yet. <laughs> Corbin using the browser. Yeah, I mean it. It's. No, but we had an issue last time as well, and it's probably because of the browser as well. Maybe. Well, thanks everybody for staying here for the past fifty minutes. <laughs> well, you can you can keep everyone entertained then. You Are you gonna regale us with your tales? My tales. Yeah. Are you going to rejoin back? Yeah, I've just got to download the download the app then. Mm. I mean, I've just always used it on the browser and it always worked. Yeah, anyway, that's why the settings are different, yeah. Uh, no, it's all good, guys. We're going to figure this out. If it doesn't work after that, then I'm doing a presentation on something. I have like six Houdini sessions opened for different things. Yes, the webinar is going to be uploaded. So the explosions workshop is going great. Uh, it's not just me working on it. I have three other guys. So it's me and three other guys. So we're really going through a lot of different examples, creating a lot of different setups, uh, rendering, compositing, everything is going to be covered. Um, it's the first, I think the first week is going to be more for like 
beginners. It, it's not an intro workshop, that's for sure, but just the first week is going to be more of an introductionary workshop to the land of voxels and stuff like that. And then the other weeks are going to be um, more advanced and then practical project-based uh, uh, um, sections. So project, uh, Corbin's, Corbin's joining. Uh, it's going to be mostly Pyro and some Axiom. Yeah, uh, Axiom is great. It's definitely faster for a lot of things, but it's just for me to explain how everything works. We need to use Pyro and then Pyro is more robust in a lot of cases. So, hey, nice. All right. We're good. There we are. Oh, wait, now your mic, you're, it's not picking up the right mic. <laughs> it's probably, on, I'm, yeah. I'm actually screen. Hi. Yeah. Better. Yes. All right. All right. Okay. Let's go. Any more technical issues? Who knows? No. Nah. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's get going. Yeah, I promise you I know how to use computers. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, roughly, this is what we're going to be covering. Um, obviously, I wanted to go through it in a little bit more detail, but I think what we'll do is we'll sort of move on. Mm. Um, but yeah, we are covering extensive amounts of de dev on this, including, yes, a whole section on USD. This whole section at the end, so this uh, USD phase two is the bit that's still to come, uh, which we want to be as good quality as possible. So. Um, Please bear with us, but it absolutely will come. And when it does, it is done hmm. by an absolute master of USD. So we will we'll be sharing with you guys like the real way to work in studios with USD rather than just us kind of uh, guessing at it. All right. Um, and you know we're using several different uh, references, but this is this is essentially the type of effect we're after. Um, although even in, in some ways we're trying to uh, kind of even improve on it. Um, so yeah, but the, particularly this kind of look here where we've got Groot sort of slowly disintegrating, um, that's the kind of thing we're, we're trying to do. So I've got a very slow dramatic scene. All right. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about in this sort of webinar so that you guys can get a, a I guess sort of a preview or a taste of what's to come is I really wanted to talk about probably the most um, interesting and kind of uh, technically most important um, aspects of this whole the whole dev right now I've done so many different disintegration effects it's actually insane like I started to at one stage think that's basically all I was going to do is just disintegrate things mm -hmm. I mean especially even on on Sandman it's actually funny how literally we've got a a lady turning into sand, a guy disintegrating into a ghost, um, obviously the main character turning into sand all the time. Like there's just so many disintegrations and there's different ways to do it. Oh, there's one stage where he gets like infected on his face and it sort of like spreads, it's like poison. And so his whole face goes like just, there's loads of ways that this is applicable. Mm. And every single time I've done it, I've always thought, oh, there were ways to improve it. So this was kind of like, after all of that, Dave, this was, I finally got to sit down and say, right, with the, all the time in, in the world, how would I do this the right, right way? Um, so that's basically what I've set up here. So we have a character um, who does have some animation, but in this case, I've actually frozen her on a single frame so that I can, for the sake of the webinar, I can just show you a little bit quicker, but she is actually walking sort of out into the, into the sun, into the desert. and squinting into the sun and we're using the sun as a way to sort of trigger this disintegration it starts on her hand also we delay the face because it's shielded by the hand and obviously so that we can then read her emotion a little bit longer and then she basically disintegrates so like the story is that she is kind of has been like almost sentenced to death or something and she has to like walk out into the desert and just kind of evaporate okay some kind of sci-fi planet where it's just so so hot right now, I'm going to show you several stages, sort of like the evolution of, of, um, 
of how you would do disintegration and why we're doing it the way we are rather than some of the older ways. Okay. Um, obviously, in the film effects workshop, we don't, I mean, we do discuss this, but we discuss it in even more detail. And in fact, we, we lay down all the nodes. Whereas here, I'm going to give you an overview just for the sake of, of speed, really. Um, but this over here represents the kind of like the old school and most manual way uh, of doing it, right? So we, we have a disintegration value set up. So, you know, here I'm just basically using the, the character in a particular pose and we're, we're using the kind of dot product of, of the direction of the wind and then her body plus a bunch of noise to essentially set up some value that says, hey, this is the part of her that is starting to decay. Okay, so these are the, the initiation points. You could paint them by hand, you could set them in any way you want. Like, you know, it could be that she gets hit by, I don't know, you've got a character that gets hit with like sort of like darts that then start to like, you know, disintegrate them from that point. Then those could be animated points. Whatever, it doesn't matter as long as you have these some values to begin with. And then the point of the decay map is essentially how do we spread this? Okay. So the really most simple way of doing this, which is obviously a bad way for very many reasons, is to just basically inside of a solver, we, we look at our neighboring points, grab their decay values, and then essentially add it to our own decay value. And in this case, we're actually considering ourself as well. So the point itself will see its own, its own self. So even if none of its neighbors have any value and it has a decay value of 0 0.1, it will still eventually reach one. So every point will kind of grow because at the very least it sees itself with a value. But all of its neighbors will start to get its decay value and therefore it will fetch its neighbor's value. And so it kind of exponentially gets, um, like it fills it up. Right. And we're chasing a value of one. So we clamp it to one because we're basically saying, right, you decay from zero until, okay, one, you are now decayed. Now, obviously, I don't want to go through the painful process of running that. So I've, I've already cached it out. And this is essentially the, the result we get. Okay. So I have this decay value and over time it spreads. Now, why is this a problem? Why is this a bad way of doing it? Well, I mean, for one, I didn't even manage to decay it all in 1,600. Well, okay, you know, starting from 1,000. So in 600 frames, I didn't manage to decay her. So now I've got to go back and do it again. And sometimes you think you've got it all, but actually it didn't get every single point. So then it causes problems like, why do I have a random floating point? Oh, no, it doesn't have a decay value of one because it never got there. This is just a bad idea. Also, because you basically have to, you're either working with a live sim, which a lot of the time gets stuck, and then you have to start hitting, like you have to hit reset, or you click it, and it has to recook every time, and or you have to cache it out, in which case you're caching individual frames over this whole timeline, which you want for a high resolution, you want a lot of points. So now, I mean, I've only got a million here, but you, because that, that's because I cut her, cut her off at the head here, just for the sake of the webinar. You would be having more points even than that. So it took a long time to cook. It's difficult to work with. And worst case, like the worst part of it is, okay, the director says, right, you know, we start decaying her. And then by the end frame, I want to see it exactly this kind of way, like maybe decayed up to like her ear. And then you have to now go and tweak the setting and resim, and then go, oh no, hang on, it went too far, right? Let me tweak the amount of spread resim oh, okay hang on now it didn't go far enough what a pain right so a lot of reasons why this is not a good way to go the only pro that this method has is that because we're doing it live and like a solver you could have two different moments where you initiate some decay so maybe it starts spreading from her head and while it's spreading an another initial decay starts to spread from like her shoulder or something and starts going the other way. And those moments can happen at two different times. There is a way around that in our other ones, but that is the only thing that this has over our other methods. Now, to get around the fact that it's difficult to make sure that it decays to exactly the shape we want on a certain frame, of course, you, after caching here, you could retime. Okay? 
But again, if you have cached it and you retime, then you need to make sure that you calculate subframes in the right way or, you know, so it can even that can be a little bit difficult, but it's possible to retime this. But still, you've had to cache, you know, you go all the way to the end and, oh, no, hang on, I need more frames. Let me recache. It's just stupid, right? So let's improve on this. So what we actually want to do then is say, I don't really want to track live how you are decaying. Uh, also, because it's really important to note that time dependency is so huge like it has a giant impact on how your scenes are and in fact i'm gonna make this huge and i always do this like i had a scenario where i was so i was super supervising a film and i was working with an artist who was struggling to get his shot finished and i sat down to like kind of work through his shot with him and it was just like it was like pedaling through mud Every node was just heavy, and we're waiting for this to cook, and we're waiting for that, and then this, and then it crashes, and then we have to wait again, and then we click, and we change a value, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and it was like, no wonder this guy is like churning out like one version a week, because it's just impossible. But it's because he wasn't thinking about what is cooking every time he changes, you know, you change, you change one setting here and then it has to recalculate everything. Or you go one frame later and even though nothing is changing, no values are changing, because the node was time dependent and then he might have frozen it, it's still time dependent. Because if you have, like, let's say your character has rest, um, like, you know, your character is, let's say, an animated character, um, you have a crag, whatever, this guy's time dependent, right? But we can calculate rest. Okay, so let's say we have a rest frame. Uh, let's make that frame one. That's his rest. The rest is static, but he is time dependent. And now we say here v at p equals v at rest. So now he's at his rest position. It's still time dependent. Even if no attributes are changing, Houdini doesn't know how to assume that, like, to, to kind of guess, oh, hang on, I've, I've frozen everything else. So it remains time dependent, which means every node that happens after this has to recook every frame, no matter what it's doing. Okay. And that can be insane. Yeah. So I wanted to point that out because this is what we're going to now fix. So we say we don't want to have decay tracked live. What we're going to do is basically mark the frame where decay reaches one. And then we're going to work backwards from that. So now we have a frozen value. We can work on non-time dependent nodes as late as possible, which includes, and I'll show you just now, but it includes even all of our vellum constraints and everything. Then at the end, we recalculate our decay based on that final frame when it uh, reaches decay. Okay. That way, it, we can basically keep super light and also we're rebuilding it at the end, which means that if the director says, oh, actually, I want it to decay a little slower, we don't have to resim. We've got that end frame. We just have to make the start frame a little bit earlier. And because mm -hmm. we're dynamically calculating that, everything is just live, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's theoretically what we do. So we set this end frame to a negative one. So I want sort of like a, f a failed value or like a default value that is clear that I have not successfully set it to anything. Then we run our spreading decay in the solver. Fine. But then what's happening is whenever we reach a value of one, we put it in a group and we store its frame number. Okay, so oh, cool. You've successfully reached that now. Uh, what frame was that on? Oh, 1,200. So remember 1,200 and then join this group. And that group gets excluded from this again. So it won't overwrite the frame value progressively. Also, it makes it more optimized because now it's not having to run this every frame. Same in here. We could even say, oh, don't consider those points as well if you want to. Right. And then what we do is we time shift to the end frame. 
So now we don't have to cache multiple frames, we only cache a single frame, right? Which seems like a good idea. Still, we have the same problem. So we're gonna, we're gonna try and solve that uh, of it not completing. And even if it was complete, what if it completed over, let's say 1,300, that, that frame? And we've, we've had to calculate, we've had to cook 300 frames unnecessarily but where all the points were already fully decayed. What a waste, okay? So we're gonna fix that. But at least we've improved on the previous version because now this has this decay end value, okay? Obviously we have a whole bunch of negative ones, so we at least know some areas didn't finish, but of those that did finish, we, can, we now know what frame they ended on and we can, this is non-time dependent. We could do a whole bunch of work in between and then right before our sim, we go and essentially build in reverse. We, we basically take our end frame, refit it, set a duration, and now we basically can define a start and an end frame, okay? And you see the decay spreads. But this is one of those where now the director says, oh, actually, do you know what? I want it to end a little bit sooner. So we go, okay, well then we'll just end it sooner. So now between 1,100 and 1,200, it does that same spread, okay? Or you wanna offset certain areas, so you wanna just change their start and end, or even their duration based on noise, well, we can. So without the noise, this is how it's spreading, maybe a little bit too smooth and linear, so I can go and add some noise. But the noise is not just random, it is actually offsetting it forwards and backwards in time with, without having to do a, because time shift is a really bad way of shifting forward and backwards in time. Mm. It's quite expensive because it can only act, act on detail level. So it takes the entire object forward or backwards. Whereas this is a, it's per point, because it's not really shifting forward and backwards. It's just a value that's like that, that one frame number that you're holding on to minus a number. And we can define that number and we can slide it back and forward. We've also even been able to then delay for example, like the face specifically. And in fact, I think in this case, I don't have the mask um, transferred, but basically we're able to paint certain areas and manually delay that mm -hmm. without having to resim. Mm -hmm. So much, much better, but still not there yet because I don't like the fact that we didn't finish. And if we did finish, how many frames were wasteful? Okay, and it can really make a difference. It can really matter because when we're talking about a million points here, Maybe it's not that many, but when you've got a really, really detailed character, this can be with a difference between hours. Yeah. Okay. So um, I did put my cook times here, by the way. This was on this machine with just the head with just a million points. These are the cook times. So we're a very similar amount of cook time, but at least this is more usable to me. Mm. Okay. Um, but still wasteful. So. This is now where we start to get a little bit more interesting. Um, and as I said, in the film effects workshop, we actually, we, we build all of this, we write all this code. So this is just an overview. So in here, we're gonna do a very similar thing, but instead of, cause I mean, we were, we're time shifting to the end. So does it really matter? Does it really need to be a solver? You know, not really. It just, we just wanna calculate that spread again and again and again and again and again. So. We're just doing that inside of a loop and the loop gives us the benefit of being able to give it far more iterations. I mean, sure, you could with the time shift here, you could shift to frame 10,000, but then we don't have a way of kicking out of that solver early. Whereas in the loop we do. So we've got a stop condition here, which we learn how to do. And in fact, the stop condition actually has a a little bit of a, an annoying kind of gotcha where as soon as it believes it should stop it immediately stops that iteration before it even ends the iteration so actually we stop one iteration too short so we actually do a little trick where we store a stop condition value at detail level and then on the beginning of the loop we check the value from the incoming geometry mm. and if it says you should stop then we kill it so that we get that one last iteration. So it's a little bit of a trick. Um, but basically, same thing happens in here. 
the, as what was happening inside the solver. So we're basically just transferring. Maybe we apply a little bit of noise so that some areas spread quicker than others, and then we write that out. We store it as well. So we say instead of frame number now, though, we're just storing the iteration number because that number is arbitrary. It doesn't matter. It just matters in terms of like if it took a thousand iterations for this one point to reach its final decay value, that thousand is is doesn't matter uh, like in isolation, it only matters that it's a thousand out of like whatever the maximum number is. So we also, of course, have to have an end iteration so that we know what the last one is. And with the loops, it's quite nice because with the frames, we start on frame 1001. So we always have to remember that that was our start frame. Like we always have to factor that in. But whereas with a loop, zero is just your first. And now we go, okay, so how many loops did we do? In this case, because of the stop condition, it run, ran for 1,154 iterations and then stopped itself. So it's exactly as many as we need, no more, no less. Right. So this is slightly less efficient than these, just because of the way the loop is working. But it's close. It's very similar. It has all of the benefits of the other one, like the fact that it can be refitted. So let's just copy this over here. And so we could rebuild. Now we say between frame 1,100 and 1,200, we go fully uh, decayed, um, except iteration. Yeah. Um, except this is still not good enough for me. We want to get even better than this. And the reason why this is not good enough, and this is kind of something I cover a lot in the workshop, is how. Um, how to think about optimizing your scene. And I know that can sometimes feel like a little bit like, oh, well, does it really matter? You know, we're saving a couple of minutes here or there, but that's why I told the story of that artist who was stuck. And he was stuck iterating because the scene wasn't responding quick enough to be able to, uh, to kind of work really, you know? He, he, you know, every click was, waiting and waiting so you start to reach a point where you can't even think through how slow things are so you're like wait what are we looking at again and what's this you know and so and then you have to play blaster to be able to play it in real time things need to be able to respond quickly right and think about the amount of iterations you have it saves it in the long run if you're thinking in terms of how to optimize and i'll talk a lot about it in this in the workshop both in terms of what is time dependent or not but also think about this we are inside of our loop. We are PC opening, right? So for those who don't know, PC open is just looking for neighboring points. Okay, and it's a very efficient way of looking for neighboring points. Uh, but neighboring is actually the wrong word because neighboring really means they're connected with um, mm -hmm. polygons, like mm -hmm. so they or they share a, a polygon um, in common with their vertices, right? This is just proximity. So it has to search in a three-dimensional sphere for all points but then also put them in order of distance and then maybe limit that distance. And, you know, so there's a lot of work it's doing. So even the most efficient way, which is a PC open, still is an expensive operation to run. So you need to, every time you do this, you need to be careful. Like point deform uses proximity. Um, attribute interpret, um, sorry, attribute transfer uses proximity, but attribute copy does not, that uses point numbers. So thinking smart about the fact that you know that anything that has to search in three-dimensional space is going to be slow. Mm. Okay. So here we're looking for our neighboring points. And then the next loop, we're looking for our neighboring points. And the next loop, we're looking for our neighboring points. But we're, our geometry is not moving. So our neighboring points are the same points every single time. But the reason we have to search for them every time is because we are writing out a handle and the handle can't be stored. Like it's, it's one of those things, the way it's optimized, it's like inside of here, we store it as this integer handle, but you can't just say I, I at, you know, my handle equals handle and write out the handle. It doesn't work that way, right? It's not data that's accessible outside. Okay. So Storing an array is less um, efficient than a handle. Mm. But what we're going to do is actually store an array only once. 
which in the long run is more efficient than writing a handle. Each frame. 1,100. Yeah. How, I mean, how many yeah, iterations did we have? Mm. 1,154 times. Or we could write one array. Mm. And that's what we're going to do in the final version of this is, okay, we, we set our initial decay value. That's fine. I'm then even to keep really optimized, I'm doing a search, just one search, one PC open, because it's non-time dependent, to find my neighbors and assess the distance between myself and all my neighbors, and then going just a little bit longer than that as the maximum distance to make sure I don't have any points that can't find a neighbor. Because then you end up with things where you don't, you're not transferring any decay value, right? Because they, they can't reach their nearest points. So we know, and I'm feeding that value in here, so we know we're only searching just the distance we need to. But what we do is we gather all of our nearby points, which, as I said, is not as efficient as a handle. But we do it once. And now we've stored a list of all of our neighboring points. So each point has a list of nearby points and the distance that each point is. So it's two arrays but they have exactly the same number of values in their arrays. And the first value of array one corresponds with the first value of array two. So they, they, every value corresponds. So I can say uh, my nearest neighbor is neighbor number 911520. And the distance that guy is away from me is 0 0.00059, whatever. Okay, mm. right. The reason we need the distance is because when you do a PC filter, it's a weighted average based on distance. So this PC filter um, operation, which is really, really nice, it gives us lo this lovely weighted average. So nearby points give me more of their value and distant points, I kind of consider them a little bit, but not really, okay? It's like imagine asking someone's opinion, but someone who you value a lot, who's close to you, you their opinion counts more, but you might ask some random guy on the street as well, and he gives you an opinion, but you're kind of like, well, thanks for telling me, but I don't really, care about your opinion that much. That's sort of what it's like, right? But we have to sort of rebuild that function ourselves, which is a little bit of extra work. But the fact that we've now been able to run this iteration, like this proximity search once is insane. And you want to look over here? That's my cook time on this. 30 seconds versus four minutes and 30 seconds. And that is on just one small part of this, okay? This is the type of thing that I want to teach a lot in this workshop is how to think about optimizing your scenes. We can see there how it's blasting through these numbers. Also, I did see someone mentioning multi-threading. Um, as far as I know, uh, so with this type of loop we're doing here is a... Um, feedback loop. So at the end of the first pass, the results have to go back in to the top and then run the second pass. So you can't multi-thread it. Every, every iteration is based on the previous iteration, so it can't run them separately. Okay. Mm, yeah. So compiling basically wouldn't make it go any faster. So you want to compile, well, let's say you're doing a for reach through, so you've got like a grid that's got a, a thousand points. If you do a for each point, then one, you know, one node can look at a hundred points and then, you know, so you, maybe you've got 10, you know, then you can divide them up and manage them separately. Um, you know, so it's, it's like, it's like having, you know, I don't know, like you need to make a hundred burgers but you've got 10 chefs or 10, 10 cooks. So you go, well, you each make 10 burgers, cool. That's fine. But if, if you had a production line where you had to make the bread and then make the thing and, then, you know, like, and every stage is needing the previous stage to be completed before it can do its thing, then you, everyone's waiting and it kind of bottlenecks. But unfortunately, that is the nature of, a, of the spreading attribute is we cannot do it multi-threaded, mm. which is why it's so important to find another way to optimize it. So there it is. I actually wasn't paying attention. I don't know if it actually did take exactly that time, but you can see there 927 uh, loops, but 
that's because it also the final one it breaks so we're actually one short of that and then we are uh, we start at one so it, it actually 927 means 925 iterations right um and now we've got this single frame that's really easy to cache it took so long uh, like so short to calculate and then of course we can run the exact same thing where we can uh, refit it it's live oops uh, you know it's live we don't have to re re sim i mean look uh oh, okay hold on why is that going so short let me 1300 there we are right so i'm gonna now plug into the final one so hold on so now that we have it working really well, this is how we can use it. So you see here that everything we're doing, this is all non-time dependent. Everything's set at rest. We're transferring things like, so for example, here I've got my character, the skin, and I've painted a, oh no, sorry, that's over there. So here I'm using the skin to define depth to figure out basically um, I'm separating flesh and uh, bone. Um, so it's in this case. I think my character is hollow. She not. Anyway, sorry, I'm not sure why that's not working, but anyway, that's not that important. But I can basically do a whole bunch of operations on this. Uh, for example, here I'm painting a delay map. Mm -hmm. So I've got her face painted to say, hey, I want this area to be decayed after these others. I don't have to rewrite the sim. I've, you know, I've got an end frame and now everything is relative to one another. So then we're going to just change the timeline. So I transfer that to my points, but I'm transferring it to my points while it's non-time dependent. So this proximity search is done once, not like, you know, I could do it one step later and then it would be time dependent. And now that is now going to slow my scene down massively. And people do that without thinking. So many times I look at scenes and I'm trying to debug and I just start going and disabling, disabling, freeze that, do whatever, and then suddenly I can work really quickly. Okay. So this is our final refit, which we're going to build properly um, and discuss all the ways of coding this um, later down the line. But I can basically set an in frame, set an out frame, and it goes spreading and fills the face, mm. right? Absolutely perfect, real time. What's real time as well is the fact that I can make changes. So the director says, all right, hold on, I want the face delayed even more. I'm losing too much of it. Okay, well, then let's delay the face more. Done. What else do you want? You know, oh, you want it to start a few frames later? Fine, let's switch it to 1,400. Cool, that's it, fine. Now it finishes later. You know, it is so easy to work with. Now, let's quickly chat about the one downside which would be the downside of all of these methods if you had to do any refitting, which is that let's say, I use the instance of like, well, the example of a dart. So let's say this character is running through a jungle and is like being chased by like, I don't know, some people like those, you know, there's like blow darts with like poison in it or something, right? So dart hits and it starts to decay from there. And then another one hits another part of their body and starts to decay from there. So you've got these two moments of like injection of a value that wants to spread. Well. This took us 30 seconds to cook, right? But obviously, if we start refitting it, we would refit the whole thing, which means that um, when the second dart hits a shoulder, that shoulder is already busy decaying because we took the whole value and we refitted it. So we can't do that. But all we do, because it's so light now and so efficient, is we run two separate decay maps or one, it's the same loop, but you just have two separate attributes, decay one and decay two that you spread and you do the whole thing. After refitting them, you add them together. Well, not add, but what you would do is you would maximum them. So when they overlap, then they just, they still go up to a value of one. But now you've got these two separate, you know, injections of values that you can fit completely separately and they just go on top of one another. Mm. Easy. So, you know, even the one downside we can get around. And in terms of efficiency, I just want to show you yet again, even just in terms of optimizing what we're doing in this scene. So I built a few visualizer nodes, which if you do the workshop, you'll know that I always make my uh, think 
well, I guess the sort of pinky purple color is my uh, visualizing nodes. So they are not pop proper nodes. They are just there to check and test things. So I'm reapplying my animation here, which in the ca this case, it's not animation. It's just a, the a frozen pose of the character. Um, but still, you, could, you would reapply your animation here. Um, and then freeze a frame so that you're able to check what's happening. And then I want to make those points so uh, like I'm visualizing it as a sprite, or we can do um, these um, GL sphere points. Okay, obviously I've set a really, really small P scale. That's just because the sprites freak out and crash your scene if the P scale is too large. I'm setting color. And then what I want to do is I'm essentially testing this effect. So we've got a wind. The global wind that we build later on but what's really cool with this wind is it can apply on it can be applied at sop level um, it can be applied inside of a dop at on pyro on um, pops on anything okay we use it on our vellum everything can use this one node okay because it's actually a vop node so you can put it in a gas vop uh, um, vop anything and include including a sop vop um, and then I'm reading my same decay values from here to here. So you see, this is the moment where my network becomes time dependent, but I've made sure to set, using my wind, I've set a static w velocity value first. Then after it's time dependent, I'm now just simply applying that. So instead of applying my wind here, I'm just reading my um, static velocity and then my decay value. And that makes all the difference. I'm gonna show you the difference because on the right here, this is those same nodes, but just in a slightly different order and how much uh, quicker this is. I can, I can scrub through and see this character disintegrating. I'll point out that this is just a single vector value that's multiplied by the decay. We obviously are gonna run this in a proper dop so we're going to have proper wind that actually changes and evolves but this is just a way for me to offset my points in the same direction as the wind and kind of get in this uh like almost like a guess of what it's going to look like as this character dis uh, disintegrates okay mm -hmm. i can basically scrub through this or if i hit play you can see i'm running at about like four frames a second right even if I want to see it in real time, I can play blast it, but I play blasting and I wouldn't even be able to go make a cup of tea and come back and this would be still, this would be done, right? Same thing. I mean, I've just switched over and nothing changed, okay? Same thing. Okay, actually this, yeah, it's not seeming as bad, but I checked it earlier. It literally went from, it was, this was four, frames a second and this mm. one i don't know what i've changed to make it not but this was saying uh it was something it was it changed from frames per second to frames per minute mm. is how slow it was running right all because i'm trying to basically set the wind here and apply it rather than applying it once and then just moving the points by the velocity so here's another example these two, right? This is how I first built it. And I was like really frustrated with how slow it was going. Then I rebuilt it this way, right? So this is us getting ready. Later on, you'll see we, we do this in the course. Us getting ready to do the vellum, okay? So I've got my decay map spreading over here. Visualize, okay. So decay map spreading, cool. Um, I create a noise so that I can transfer the attributes to the... Um, the grid of points that are going to be my grains, um, and I'm transferring them with a little bit of noise. I set some ID, I create some clusters. So this is basically little groups that we're then going to um, constrain together um, in, in Vellum, as well as well, I also have an attraction weight, which is based on that clumping. So toward the center of the clump, it's like there, it's like wet sand, and then to the edges, it's drier, right? And then I create my constraints, which creating constraints is a very heavy process. And now I've got a time dependent. Even though nothing changes in the constraints from frame to frame, the node is marked time dependent. So it has to recook again and again and again and again, right? So I'm not even going to go into the sim. I'm just going to click on this node and hit play, right? I mean, there we are. Now we've hit frames per minute. Mm. 2.6 frames per minute. 12 frames per minute. Wow. 
Okay. Now this, if we're, when we're running our sim, even though the sim wants to load only the first frame, it doesn't really, because it loads the first frame with, for some data, but then other data it has to fetch every frame, and when it fetches it every frame, it is slow. So the speed of our, like, I always use this trick, right? Um, when I'm t trying to help debug someone's scene, I say, don't, don't click on the, the, the sim, right? Don't click on the dop. Go to one node before the dop and hit play. If that is not almost real time, if you can't scrub that, then your sim is going to be slow, and it has nothing to do with your sim. Right. Now watch this. Okay, no, it's obviously going to take long. See, up to this point, these are the same nodes, but in a different order. Mm. I've, I'm, doing, I'm calculating my constraints and my cluster and doing everything non-time dependent. So even though this cluster node is actually quite heavy, and the vellum constraints node uh, is actually quite heavy, it cooks once. So that first cook is a bit slow. But now, hit play, we're running at there, what, 12, 13, 15 frames per second. Mm. Same nodes, different order. I now have a sim that will run infinitely faster because it's not waiting for the source. So maybe the sim will be slow, but then that's the sim's fault. Mm -hmm. And then we can maybe try and optimize the sim and whatever. But it doesn't matter what you do to your sim. If it's waiting every frame, or the source, it's like I say, peddling through mud. It's horrendous to work like that. So, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about this and the decay map. Not only does this, the way we've laid it out, give us a lot of functionality that we would like from a decay map, it also gives us that the option of being incredibly optimized and so we can work really, really quick. Mm. Okay. Um, one other thing that I will sort of just lightly tease, but I'm not going to go deep into it. We also build another really cool feature into the actual decay map spread, right? Which is that we build a, I didn't really know what else to call it. So I just called it a rig um, because really we are sort of rigging these points together, but it's like a dynamic rig, right? So hold on, where is it? Right. So here it is. So we have the points basically starting from where the character would take its weight right? So it's feet. And they look for neighbors and they build connections all the way up. And you can think of this network, this kind of dynamic rig here as a, um, imagine it like being like a one directional highway system. Because one thing that bothers me when it comes to uh, disintegration effects, and we actually, we do see it in the Avengers disintegration, right? Is as the character is disintegrating, and you know the case spreading here on the on the neck and down the shoulder, and then the shoulder's gone, and the upper arm is half gone, mm. and the hand is still just floating in the air. Mm. It's like why? What is holding that up? Now maybe, yeah, sure, magical disintegration. It's a type where they're not like, uh, you know, still physically there or something. I don't know. The guy disintegrating into a ghost that we did in Sandman. That I'm like, yeah, cool, fine. He's not really there, so I could see it that way. But a lot of the time, I feel like, man, it looks so cheap because you would want there to be weight, mm -hmm. right? So what we do is we build this quick way without having to tell it. Um, it, it essentially calculates a gradient and uses that gradient to pass decay values down the way, but not up the way to more dependent limbs. So if the shoulder starts receiving decay value, the hand already starts decaying at the same time or just a frame or two afterwards. Whereas if the hand starts decaying, the shoulder stays and just waits. It has to creep up the arm slowly. And that's how we handle this. Now, you can use that in two ways. One is that you, you make sure that the whole arm decays kind of almost at the same time so that you don't have a floating hand. But the other thing you can do if you want to go more like maybe your decay is like a, it's not like um oh, be right back. Uh, and maybe it's more like uh, some like a disease like a virus type thing so you want more of like a gross type of decay where maybe even like limbs are falling off you would have a separate value so you have your decay traveling down the arm but you'd actually have an active value that 
travels faster down the arm. So what you would do is, you know, we've set up a whole bunch of vellum constraints. You know, we've got skin, we've got particles inside that are that are treated like soft bodies. We've even got bones, which we build into our character later on that are vellum, but they've got much more rigid um, constraints. And you would activate the entire arm because the shoulder is decaying. So then the arm actually would drop off. And you'd have, so literally the shoulder decays and the arm would fall to the ground and continue to, to sort of be eaten up from the shoulder downwards because you've been able to spread the active value uh, but keep the decay value spreading slowly. So the, that's even another way you can go, right? So really useful way and, you know, inside of here we just procedurally build this so it doesn't, I mean, it takes a few seconds to calculate. It's really optimized system and it just calculates that whole network and then inside of here it transfers up and down that network. I'll show you the difference between the two just so you can kind of get a sense. Uh, right, so let's go visualize our final result. The camera. Right, so obviously there's our character. We'll view the original first. So this is without it, right? So this is gonna be the problematic one. Let's move away and see here. So we've got shoulder decaying. Oh, and there's a floating arm. Oh, no. <laughs> really cheap. Like, the thing is, I don't even care that the shoulder's gone and the arm exists, but the arm hasn't even, like, the hand hasn't moved. Hasn't done, hasn't shown us any sense that this has affected the hand, right? Whereas, at least here, now, I did it here where I'm just tra spreading the decay itself, but you could also do the um, spreading the active, right? So at the top here, our hand has some decay value. So the shoulder doesn't decay any faster. It just spreads up the arm at a normal rate. But as soon as the sh this left shoulder starts going, the hand is already starting. You know, and there we have it. And then only a few points linger behind because my noise is probably a little bit too high. I would actually probably reduce the noise so we don't end up with these little islands. So without having to, because now you can just apply this to any other character, and it automatically creates that gradient where it goes from the most parent of limb where your weight is held and it spreads up. And so even now if, it's, if, if there was decay value like on her head, it wouldn't spread down. But if her neck started decaying, then her head would decay. Right? Cool. Sweet. So that is basically a little teaser of what we're going to cover. So details about why this works as well as how to build it. And then... Um, Oh, there is one other feature that I built into this decay, which is really important, which I haven't really mentioned, but it's the, so the way we refit it here. There's an older way I was doing it where we're fitting, which obviously um, seems, seems quite normal and natural. But what we actually end up doing is refitting in an unclamped way. If you've ever seen inside of a VOP, um, you, you've got your fit node, fit range, right? But you actually have a fit unclamped, right? We're just taking a start and end point and scaling them, but all the points on either side also scale accord accordingly, right? Well, we're basically writing the code version of that. The reason why is because what we end up with when we've got this, I'm visualizing my decay attribute here, and it's going sort of my, my visualizer goes from zero to one. So it looks like over here, these values are all blue, so they're all the same. But if you notice here, I've got negative decay values. Mm. What's super cool with this is what we've, what we've done is we've essentially created a timeline. So, and it's arbitrary, but we're kind of saying, okay, between zero and one, I want it to, to decay. But maybe before zero, and this could even come later, like the director might change their mind and say, oh, hey, uh, before this starts moving, I like how it moves and everything, but actually I'd like her skin to get kind of dry and crusty before it starts to flake away. Well, now you would, then you would have to go and resim extend the range of that and then take what let's say your sim is triggered at a decay value of zero and you'd have to shift that to trigger at a decay value of 0 0.5 to give yourself some more room what a nightmare so and believe me i've done it a million times like that and it's so bad because then you never your sim never looks the same after you mess with it like that now you've got these negative values and you can just use them so we do it in the course, we actually, so we use some negative values to set the color change, the texture change, 
to um, transition, so we fade the original geometry to reveal the flakes. Um, we also then, after it's fully decayed, we end up with positive values. So you've even got values that go above one, which if you don't want to do anything with those values, it's fine. Later on, you take decay and you fit it and clamp it and you do whatever you want with it. But maybe, and we do it, is we release all of the constraints by a value of one. But from one to two, what I start to do is take the flakes of skin, for example, and um, crumble them into sand so that they don't just go from flake to just popping out of existence or just always being flakes. I go from flakes on the skin, peeling away, and then they crumble to sand, and those sand particles are clumped first. They've got an attraction weight, and then even their attraction weight fades later and later. And so what I did is I built this cool way of like visualizing this timeline. Um, and although I've broken it now, the links, because I was obviously building this kind of um, teether mm. scene, but these lines would all be linked with certain parameters elsewhere in our scene. So we can see essentially this is a timeline of like, okay, between zero and one, where my decay value actually changes, and we can see it in the viewport, this is what's happening. At exactly zero, the flesh comes activated so the flesh vellum goes from stopped to not stopped 0 0.2 you know decay values decay units in the bones become active so now you know why the the flesh peels away before the bone is because they activate at different times and if we were just messing with parameters all the time it's possible that you would not even notice that you've accidentally shifted your flesh to start later but you didn't shift your bone and now you wonder why as soon as the flesh comes away the inside is already just crumbled because inside it's already you know crumbling so this is a nice way of like visualizing how we start to activate certain things we start to then break down the clumping we then start to dissolve the shards into individual points and then from about 0 0.8 to 1.9, we start to take the attraction weight from whatever value it is down to zero. So then even the points start to separate and become drier. And I didn't even add it to this, but we also add a p-scale fade. So like on this timeline, you can basically put all of these little parameters and see how they cascade. And because they're based not on frame numbers, but as zero to one, which is our decay value, once we've got a really cool looking decay, if the director said, do you know, actually we need, a, we need 100 extra frames, the only thing you have to do is come to your refit and say, all right, 1,400 to 1,500, recache done. Yeah, you can do it in front of him. He can literally give you notes yeah. and you do it in real time. Exactly. Yeah. So. Sweet. This is this is a huge part of what we cover. Of course, um, another big part of this is the vellum side. You know, getting those constraints to work together properly, and then also moving into USD and everything. But this is the one more technical side of the course, and I just wanted to kind of showcase something that we're going to cover. Yeah, dude, it's yeah. a lot. Any questions? <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, it's I, a lot. I especially like the way that you separate the bone from the flesh. And when it's, when it's disintegrating, you know, the bones are still like holding together and then more clamped. Yeah. I, I know some people were asking if you have any previews of that as well, like of the bones and like the clamping and stuff like that. Yeah, I do. I do have some previews. Yeah, some play blasts and things. Um, yeah. Bone is in here, but very stupidly, I didn't. Color it. maintain my bone group so then the color doesn't show it mm. but it does it does peel away um here where you lose the skin flakes on the surface go first then the flesh which is just a thin layer from the surface in like a thin layer and then i called it bone yeah i don't actually have a skeleton in here if we did that would be cool because then you would you would even have like the stomach, for example, wouldn't be full of bone. Whereas for mine, it just a certain depth inside just counts mm. as bone. Um, but you don't notice it really. It's it's all kind of peeling apart. But you do here. You have basically the flesh starts to come away, and the flesh has much softer constraints. Mm -hmm. um, so they they actually when they peel away in those chunks, they kind of they they wobble and they they bend. You know, like the bits peel, and then the bone is super rigid. 
and it has elongated shards, which we, you know, we do the whole trick with like f using a matrix to figure out a, the orientation of the bone, and then we reverse it, we squash it down, fracture it, and then spread it. But obviously, we're not fracturing like Voronoi because we we we're talking we're using points here, so we do our own sort of Voronoi um, with points. Yeah, and then we create these shards of bone, and those bone shards get really, really rigid constraints. So they, when they come away, they don't bend; they just break away as sharp shards, and those shards disintegrate. And you can kind of see it here, but I do actually need uh, another layer. So th this is one wedge that you're looking at. We do actually multiple wedges um, to fill the body yeah. with enough points so that we can actually have it look solid except that it eventually crumbles down, down into sand also here you're seeing the flakes last very long they don't really they have that decay value and at a certain point their transparency in the shader like their opacity fades to nothing but they have points scattered on their surface so as the flake fades away, it reveals the points, and then the points break down into clumps and then down into individual points. So everything kind of transitions. So we don't even have just one sort of like, okay, it's a person, and now, poof, they're sand. Mm. It's like a person, skin flakes, chunks of flesh, shards of bone, then break those. But even when those break it's it's like wet sand that's clumpy mm -hmm. and then the sand dries and then the particles get smaller and like everything kind of like has all these different like points in time where it gets like stages breaks down and breaks yeah. down yeah stages yeah. yeah that's the word i'm looking stages. for stages yeah and usually effects especially like complex looking like this are done with multiple layers and that's exactly what you're doing mm -hmm. you're kind of breaking it into layers disintegrating different elements layers and then breaking that into stages and that just makes it look super complex and realistic yeah yeah, yeah. also Sweet. something that i did to optimize is that we built a global wind which i did mention earlier but yeah. basically there's a single um a single node which we visualize here but we essentially have one control node uh, where we set the wind for the whole scene and then um so we're just visualizing it kind of like in our frustrum mm -hmm. but everything is based on this one wind so even then if the director says oh no it needs to blow away harder like we change the wind and everything our environmental effects the character the skin flakes everything is linked to this one wind but the problem is with wind like usually you would want to ha have a, like a velocity field that you then have to source in but now you have to have all these voxels storing these values it's it's really heavy we rebuilt it as a um, so it's a it's a curl noise, but it's also offset in a way that the the offset of the of the noise moves in the direction of the wind, and it's at the exact same rate. Mm. So it mimics um, waves of wind moving like through a field or something, and it um, and that happens without you needing to rasterize and then create this giant like field. You can just load in the noise. You know, it's a, it's an algorithmic field rather than an actual cached like a bunch of voxels. So um, you don't have to advect particles by another thing. You just run this one wind on everything, and it all moves the same way. Yeah. Okay. Dude, cool. awesome. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions uh, for anyone? By the way, here's the here's showcasing the wind um, tool. By the way, just even at SOP level, you can see it kind of like creates like grass, creates wind. moving waves mm -hmm. of of wind. So this is like a completely no sim approach. It's okay. It's very slow. I have to scrub faster. The reason it's slow is because my wind settings for the shot are very slow. Mm -hmm. You could just increase that value, and then you've got like waves of wind moving through. Except none of this is voxels at all. It's mm -hmm. just curl noise values. Yeah, anyway sweet yeah dude i think cool. it's gonna be you said 20 hours just for this one how did you manage to record 20 hours in the past week that's insane <laughs> it is insane i it's a lot got up <laughs> i started recording i stopped for lunch then i started recording then i stopped for dinner and then i kept recording that's how I... <laughs> jesus yeah like I'd never, I mean, 20 hours is a lot, but this one is, like you said, really gem, gem packed with 
information. But like I in the beginning when we were talking about film effects, I thought the whole all three workshops together are gonna be maybe 15 hours. Even that when we were talking about it, we were like yeah. that we might hit yeah. 10 to 15 hours with all three. And now just the first yeah. one is 20 hours long. <laughs> it's crazy. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. I uh, yeah. I mean, I don't do anything by halves, guys. So yeah. um, I hope you'll be patient waiting for parts two and three, mm. knowing that you've at least got a full workshop's worth already, and then everything is still coming, and you know, you guys have already paid for it, so you're going to get triple this, yeah. plus the bonus one for the legendaries. So yeah, um, so yeah, please be patient. I am working on it hard. Uh, but I also want to do it well, do it right. You know, give you know, like show you guys uh, not some kind of hacky janky scenes, but like keep it neat, like optimize the code, show you the right way to do it. Because you know, you could you could look at anyone's scene, like you know, at a studio, just some other artist, and you know, you can check their scene and go, oh, that's a cool technique. How did you get there? But like learning, like better ways to do the same things you've been doing is is going to actually change your whole career and help you work faster and better and smarter and that's what i'm trying to do here so not just show you cool things but actually um fundamentally change the way you look at houdini yeah it's it's the whole thinking process behind yeah. the effect and yeah yeah also thinking how to reverse engineer something but in as efficient exactly. way as possible exactly and that's the purpose of the whole workshop is mm -hmm. kind of like you're given a reference from the director like so usually it's they'll point to a film so like in this case they go oh we're doing a disintegration effect yeah like the avengers and that's what they usually say and they'll send you a reference and so now you go oh, okay how do, now i've got to figure out how to make that and we go all the way from that to like coming up with a plan and then working through the dev and then working through the shots and then getting to the final result, all of that. And we're doing it in a way that is optimized. And we're thinking all the time about how we are going to get notes from the director. So how can we keep things light and efficient and moving and iterating? And we optimize, like I cut off just the head, I get it working. I do small little tests. You'll see throughout the workshop, I like break away. I do like just the kind of grid, fracture it into flakes and make sure that the vellum actually works before I then go and do it on the, so these are all ways to make you like better artists. And genuinely, what I'm trying to teach you guys is really the very difficult step of getting from like a mid to a senior. Like to get, you know, from intern to like junior to mid is just about kind of like learning more Houdini, but this is the stuff that gets you from like mid to senior. Yeah. Where you're like, not just doing a cool effect, but you're doing a cool effect Lost. Yeah. Hundred percent. And I know you already have a bunch of dev done on the bubble bomb, and you have some dev done on yeah. the, the the obscurus effects. So I think the bubble bomb. I think you almost have all the dev done. So that's also going to have to. Yeah, I'm on. I've done primary effects, which if you watch the breakdown in the thing, I'll talk about what's primary and secondary. Primary effects are done. Maybe I'll tweak some timing a bit, but mm. secondary effects, I just need to run those and then basically start recording. Um, Obscurus is devved, but no shot work is done yet. So that I'll that will be the third effect. Um, yeah. So that still needs a little bit more kind of work on it before we get there but yeah yeah i'm really looking forward well bubble bomb is great but i think the obscurious the obscurious you're really really gonna go all out and like make it better it's than... my favorite effect <laughs> yeah. i think of all time that i've ever yeah. seen i think that's gonna be very yeah. interesting yeah. just because it combines so many different elements uh yeah mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to that one for sure what was the bonus one yeah because we did a vote but i mm -hmm. We did a vote and I can't, I don't actually know what was chosen or whether we were going to continue the vote or let it be open until we, until I'm ready to start, then maybe we lock in the votes. I don't know how you want to do it, but. Yeah, I, I know there was, let me quickly check. Vote, film effects. Okay. What was While it? you're finding that, is there any, is there any questions about I think it was the, the nebula or anything 
I'm actually surprised nebula. it was What's the that? nebula. Because I, I prefer the that other the ones. the main black one. No. Yeah. No, no, it just... Was it? Was it? Yeah, yeah, the Men in Black Nebula. Yeah, yeah, that was the one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that okay. got 55 votes. I don't know, I kind of like... the. Uh, for some reason, Iron Man got the least amount of votes, but that's the one I would pick. It also has a disintegration, but it's very cool. Like, it's based on veins. It kind of goes... Uh, yes. And then it has that electricity, like, going towards him. Uh, the thing yeah. is, I will say... I'm happy to do that one if you do if you guys maybe if we do open up the votes again in order to add mm. votes to what people already have said and maybe it goes the direction of that Iron Man one that's fine but I will say you could probably use the same disintegration techniques but just simply really what you would do is have veins going down and those areas would just have a uh, much higher like when they tra when you transfer your decay value they would just take 100 percent of the decay value but the areas between would resist the decay value a lot more mm -hmm. so it would spread down the veins before spreading to the other areas and then you add some lightning i mean it's uh it's not that difficult so it's probably the simplest of all three yeah um and then obscurus will be similar i have similar techniques to the um nebula thing from men in black Whereas I think the most like very different effect is the is that explosion from the you know there's that blizzard thing, mm -hmm. the blue one, the uh, green one. That one was, yeah, that one was like its own whole separate dev. But anyway, it's they'll be they'll be fun, whichever yeah. one we pick. I mean, I think in the long run, if everyone loves those effects, I'll end up doing all of them, but just for different yeah. projects. I guess. Yeah, I was about to say like I I hope we can do all of them, uh, if we get enough support from everybody and we can continue building double jump we are just going to be doing this <laughs> you know we can yes then actually do everything yeah. and and go through all the effects exactly. rebuild every movie and every game cinematic <laughs> forever and yeah. ever i mean look i'll be honest guys i love giving and i love figuring this stuff out and i love teaching um mm. so but if you guys are engaged i will keep making stuff um, and as you've seen, we've got a giant list of other incredible artists, much better than me, uh, teaching as well. So, yeah, yeah, there will be no shortage of content. Hmm. Somebody said the Dune shield bomb explosion. I think that's I think we're going to cover that in the explosions workshop. That might be one of the bonus effects. I'm not sure yet, but it was on the list for the explosions workshop. Yes, yeah, I've seen it on one of our lists. I just wasn't sure yeah. which workshop had it. But yeah, we, we will cover that one. Yeah, That's a cool one. It's cool. Or in the big ship, you mean like the the rain of fire? Like the... What was it? I forgot what the scene was called. But yeah, we're doing a lot of stuff from Dune. Well, in the Explosions workshop, a lot of stuff from the creator and some other movies, essentially covering a wide variety of different explosions from super huge to smaller, you know, different, just variety of things. Uh, and we're also going to be rebuilding the explosions emitter from scratch. So you guys can then, I, I feel like the explosion, the emitter is like 80% of the work when it comes to explosions. So once you have the emitter done, and once you know how to control your emitter, you can then use whatever solver you want. You know, it can be uh, Axiom or Pyro or whatever is going to be released in the future. It doesn't matter. As long as your emitter is correct, you can then plug it into any solver and it's still going to look uh, correct because the emitter is where you get the speed, is where you get the shapes, where you get the timing. So, yeah. Yeah. We're going to be yeah. i mean that's that. that's one of the fundamental rules is so you get your source right and then your yeah. sim is almost like just it's secondary. honestly so it yeah. really is and people yeah. usually get kind of <clears throat> bogged down with all the settings in the pyro solver you know like that was my my experience you know like a decade ago when i started using houdini i opened it up and then you mm -hmm. had the pyro solver and i was like well what do i do there's like a billion settings. Mm -hmm. What is buoyancy? I don't know, <laughs> you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously all of those things are important to know, but 
you yeah. get really instead of working on your emitters and your your sources you kind of waste a lot of time tweaking values in the you solar. create a sphere as a source yeah. and then you're like trying to get your sim you're trying to look to... right with yeah. settings in the sim yeah. and it's like you're never going to get that looking good uh, yeah. it's amazing how often my sims if you dive inside it's basically the the object the solver the source mm. and then like one or two nodes like basically like maybe setting some kind of limit or something and then like maybe just adding like a sourcing a vector field uh like or something you know like all the work is done outside. Even in this workshop, the Vellum sim is like barely, barely touched the settings because it doesn't matter if everything, you've got your constraints, you've got your strengths, the velocity from the wind, everything's set up before, then your solver is just kind of like just basically running that data frame by frame. So, yeah. yeah. Yep, I agree. Sweet. I think that's it. I think Corbin, yeah, for your um, FMX presentation, you will have to be shorter <laughs> because we have. I will, but we have like forty-five minutes, right? And we have to kind of. Yeah, I've got, it. I think I've yeah. got like twenty minutes. Yeah. So no, I'll. Uh, it will be the um, very trimmed down version of this for FMX. Yeah. Trimmed. You down. guys always get. Yeah. Get special, special treatments. It's, this is a extended director's cut version <laughs> the right to scout of the, <laughs> but yeah of the uh, teaser trailer of the yeah of the of part one of the film mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah um but yeah if you guys want to sign up we're gonna open up film effects again in about a week and a half a bit before fmx and then it's gonna be opened until we come back i guess from fmx and if you sign up for the waitlist you get the discount otherwise they're so the only the only time we're going to be doing discounts at Double Jump is for pre-sales and wait lists. That's where the discounts, that's where you can get the discounts because uh, you get in early and you help help us, you support us by purchasing the workshop. You get kind of rewarded for that. Any other time, we're not going to be doing any discounts. So that's why I'm saying join the wait list. But yeah, I think that's it. Cool. That's it for this Thank one, you very guys. much, everyone. I'm yeah. really excited about this one. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, ask loads of questions on the Discord. If you, if there's a lot of the same question, or maybe just every now and then, we'll even just have a webinar like this, or like a basically like a live chat where people yeah. can just come with a whole bunch of questions and stuff. Yeah. So I'll organize that in future. Uh, but otherwise, just ask stuff on the Discord. Help each other out as well, especially if mm. it's been the same questions, because I can't always be on the Discord because I've got other workshops to make. But I will, uh, every day I'll be on Discord and ask as, answer as many questions as I can. And um, then, like I say, maybe do a couple of live sessions as well to, to like batch answer some stuff or do reviews. If you guys have like your own characters that you want to apply this effect to, do it. That would be better if you don't just use mine, but actually do your own shot with it. I would love to review those. That would be cool. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Cheers, guys. Thanks for joining in. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.